after that introduction, it's all going to be downhill from, from here, uh, honestly. <laughs> um, thank, you, uh, thank you all for coming. Um, and uh, before I begin, I just want to say everything I'll be talking about today is part of a long-term collaboration with uh, David Vassar at uh, Yale University. He's a former postdoc of mine. It's now prof at Yale. Um, and, uh, and of course, it's also the product of uh, the assistance of various uh, undergraduate and uh, graduate research assistants over the years. So, in 1657, Christian Huygens invented the pendulum clock. And in 1665, he noticed something very odd. Two of his clocks, suspended side by side on the same wall, exhibited what he called an odd kind of sympathy. Their pendulums swung at the same frequency, but precisely out of phase, so, so like this. And uh, if perturbed, they would return to swinging precisely out of phase with one another within half an hour. Uh, this is his drawing of his uh, two clocks. Huygens' observation was the first observation of what we would now call synchrony. So in the broadest sense, synchrony refers to um, separate parts of some system fluctuating in a correlated fashion. Okay? Um, synchrony is very common in nature. Uh, fireflies in the mangrove forests of Malaysia uh, flash in synchrony. Okay? Um, schooling fish. Uh, all often turn in the same direction at the same time, right? As, so they swim in synchrony as if there was some central overseer telling them all what to do. Of course, there's, there's not. Um, uh, neurons in your body uh, fire synchronously. So this is an EEG uh, chart of the um, activities of different neurons over time. Um, sometimes that synchrony is a good thing. It's what keeps your heart uh, beating rhythmically. Uh, if it's not operating, you have an arrhythmia, which is bad. Um, sometimes that synchrony is a bad thing. It's what causes seizures. Um, gene expression fluctuates uh, synchronously. So in this chart, uh, in each of these panels, each row shows the express is uh, the measure of the expression of a different gene over time. And um, genes involved in the same function tend to be expressed at the same time, but at different times than genes performing a uh, different function. And finally, uh, synchrony is even given its name, of course, to one of our more unusual Olympic sports. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about uh, and spatial synchrony in population ecology. So spatial synchrony here refers to spatially separated populations of the same species exhibiting correlated fluctuations in abundance. This is a very common phenomenon in nature, although not you know, universal. Um, I've only shown a few uh, examples here. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a particularly famous one. This is uh, data from uh, Elton Nicholson on uh, Canadian uh, lynx dynamics, uh, which of course is a famous example of predator price cycles. What's somewhat less famous is those cycles are synchronized across all of Canada. So each of these lines shows um, data from a different uh, region in Canada. You can see the links are all peaking and crashing at the same time in different regions. Um, Canada's a big place. Uh, some of these regions are separated by thousands of kilometers. Okay, that's freaking amazing when you think about it, right? Like, how do the links in one end of the country know what the links in the other end of the country are doing, right? How do they all remain in, you know, lockstep here, right? Um, Especially because, in contrast to many of the previous examples of synchrony I showed you, synchrony in population ecology is not sort of designed into the system intentionally, and it's not, nor is it sort of an adaptive phenomenon, right? It's just something that happens, even though the system hasn't been sort of designed or selected to exhibit synchrony. And so, I think in general, synchrony is interesting because it indicates some mysterious connection between apparently unconnected objects, and we'd like to understand what those connections are. Um, so theory has identified three causes of spatial synchrony, which is one thing that makes this topic nice to study because there's a short list of possibilities. Okay. So um, one is dispersal. Dispersal of organisms from one population to another partially mixes those populations and couples them together, thereby synchronizing them. Second, um, spatially synchronous environmental fluctuations, such as regional scale weather variation, can bring populations into synchrony. That's an effect known as the Moran effect after its uh, discoverer. And finally, um, interactions with other species. Uh, so, I mean, just in general, um, the synchrony of a focal species is going to depend in some possibly complicated fashion on the synchrony of the other species with which it 
interacts. You might think of a prey species, for instance, having synchrony affected by, its synchrony is affected by the synchrony of its predator, right? So there can be sort of indirect effects here, right? Um, we know very little about the relative importance of these different processes in generating synchrony in nature and about the interactions between them. And the reason for that is basically that it's very difficult or impossible to do experiments at the relevant spatial and temporal scales for many species. Well, what are you going to do, like manipulate the weather across all of Canada and see what happens to like link synchrony, right? Um, so uh, the work I'm going, so um, what I'm going to talk to you about is um, work in which the solution is to kind of scale nature down. So as a complement to the sorts of field studies we can do in nature, a complement, not a replacement, I'm going to talk about a, um, experiments in a deliberately simplified system that nevertheless we think should play by the same basic rules as natural systems. So we can do some experiments testing hypotheses about the uh, interplay of these different factors in generating synchrony. So I'm gonna, ju just to sharpen our intuitions and generate some predictions, I'm going to um, show you a very simple but yet sort of biologically relevant uh, model, and then I'm going to uh, test those predictions with some experiments. So, um, so here's the model. So we're going to consider a, a minimally spatial system, just two patches. Okay. And um, in each of those patches has a uh, prey species, which we'll call N, and a population of its predator, P. Okay. And... Uh, there's a dispersal of both species from one patch to another, so both species can move around. And uh, both patches are subject to environmental fluctuations, which um, may or may not be uh, synchronized. So that's a, sort of a cartoon. Here's the actual math. It, it looks horrible. It's actually not. Okay. This is actually just a two-patch stochastic version of the rosenzweig macarthur model that some of you may know. It's a very standard sort of textbook predator-prey, simple predator-prey model in ecology. So just to walk you through this, um, so prey species grow, and they grow logistically. Um, so, and this just doesn't look like logistic because we scaled the model so that um, intrinsic rate of increase, little r, and carrying capacity k are both equal to 1. So we're measuring the other parameters relative to those just to sort of simplify the notation. Um, so brace species grow logistically, independent of predators. They're also subject to density-independent mortality at a rate that depends, that varies stochastically over time. So that's where the environmental fluctuations enter in. So the environment is affecting so background mortality rates. We obviously we could environmental fluctuations in in a lot of different ways. That's just this is a simple, convenient way to do it. Prey species also die from predation, and predators have a type two functional response. Uh, they disperse, and we're going to make the simplest possible assumption that they disperse at a constant per capita rate e. So there's just basically diffusive movement. Prey are moving at random, and so there's net diffusion of prey from the patch that currently has higher abundance to the patch that currently has lower abundance. That's uh, not entirely unrealistic in some, uh, at least in some cases in nature. And um, there's, finally, there's also demographic stochasticity, which just means random variation in the fates of individual organisms. Sometimes an individual gets lucky, and sometimes it gets unlucky, and the net effect of that is demographic stochasticity. Um, predators, of course, grow by eating prey. Um, they too are subject to um, background mortality, that density independent mortality that's driven by environmental fluctuations. They too disperse at a constant per capita rate. Here we've assumed it's the same rate as the prey, but in general um, that wouldn't affect the behavior too much unless their dispersal rates were very, very different. And um, they predators too are subject to demographic stochasticity. Um, so I'm going to show you um, what the model predicts about uh, prey synchrony. So we're going to focus on the synchrony of prey here. I'm going to do that by showing you um, results of a, of a uh, simulated experiment in which we, in that experiment, we're going to manipulate all possible causes of prey synchrony in a factorial fashion. Okay, and then we're actually, once we have those predictions, we're going to actually then do that experiment with real organisms. Um, so let me walk you through this. Um, these are predictions for just an arbitrary sort of set of model parameters, but it turns out you get qualitatively, you get the same predictions for any parameters you pick, so it doesn't really matter. Um, so let me walk you through this. So we've got a three-way factorial experiment here. So on the y-axis, our response variable is prey synchrony. Okay. This is measured as the Z-transform cross-correlation of prey abundances in the two patches. Don't worry if you don't know what that means. Um, all, all that matters is zero means prey fluctuate independently across the two patches. There's no synchrony. Um, increasingly positive values indicate increasingly strong synchrony. <laughs> On the uh, x-axis here is um, either the predator is absent or it's present. 
So there's the effect of other species, right? Um, and the uh, dispersal is indicated by the symbols. So uh, no dispersal is the gray triangles. Uh, dis with dispersal is the uh, black circles. And this is dispersal. We're turning dispersal for both species, either on or off, is just either on or off. And um, uh, in this uh, panel on the left, we have spatially independent environmental fluctuations, so no Moran effect. In this panel, we have perfectly synchronous environmental fluctuations. So each patch experiences identical fluctuations in the environment over time, so a maximally strong Moran effect. Okay. So there's three predictions here. First, uh, not surprisingly, but just sort of like reassuringly, like it should work this way, um, dispersal is synchronizing. You know, um, so the, uh, the black points, uh, the black circles are always higher than the corresponding gray triangles. Uh, also, reassuringly, the Moran effect is you know, synchronizing, so the points in the uh, right-hand panel are higher than the corresponding points in the uh, left-hand panel. And finally, so here's the interesting thing, there's a dispersal by predation interaction. So predation dramatically increases the synchronizing effect of dispersal. So you know, with the predator, right, dis dispersal is much more synchronizing. There's a big gap there between the circle and the triangle. In the absence of the predator, dispersal hardly makes any difference at all to prey synchrony. The reason for that is because the predators generate predator-prey oscillations for the parameter values we're looking at. Um, and we're focusing on that because, it, at least for one reason, is that um, many of the most dramatic cases of spatial synchrony in nature are of oscillatory dynamics, often some sort of enemy victim oscillation, so that's the case we're focusing on. Um, so the predators generate oscillations, and oscillatory dynamics are very easily synchronized by dispersal. The jargon is they, they can be phase locked. So let me show you sort of what that is. Um, so here's a um, illustrative simulation of the model dynamics. Um, and I'm just showing you uh, prey density here over time. I'm not showing the predator, but the predator is what generates these oscillations. And we've got dynamics in two patches. And um, these patches are subject to perfectly synchronous environmental fluctuations, but there's no dispersal. So what happens here is these two patches start out in sync. Okay, they're right, right on top of one another. But demographic stochasticity kicks those oscillations out of phase. And even perfectly synchronous environmental stochasticity cannot kick those two oscillators, those two pendula, if you like, back into phase and keep them there. Okay? In contrast, if you now add in dispersal, the two populations continue to oscillate in lockstep, and they are said to be phase locked. They they can't get kicked out of phase, at least not very easily, because dispersal occurs at a constant per capita rate, and so there's always a net flow of individuals. So if you think of like, oh, currently this population is, has higher abundance than this prey population, there's going to be a net flow of individuals out of the high abundance population into the low abundance one, and so it tends to push them back into line. And the greater the density difference right, between the two populations, the greater the net dispersal rate, and so the harder dispersal pushes them back into line. Um, so the the phase lock state here is basically an attractor. That's sort of the stable dynamic of the system. It's the state the system wants to be and is going to tend to return to. Um, and uh, so that's called the phase locked uh, state. So, um, and by the way, as an aside, if you don't have predators in, in the system, you don't have cycles, the prey just grow according to a stochastic logistic. They just sort of bounce randomly around some unchanging mean density. And that's why you have little effective dispersal. There are no cycles, so there's nothing to phase lock. So in the absence of predators in this model, density differences between the two prey populations are just constantly being created at random. And dispersal can neither synchronize those perturbations nor erase them or prevent them. So that's why dispersal has very little effect on synchrony in the absence of predators. So uh, summary of the model prediction is dispersal is synchronizing, Moran effect is synchronizing, and the interesting one, Predators that generate oscillations greatly increase the synchronizing effect of dispersal. So that's a statistical signature of phase locking here. So we're going to do that experiment. Okay. And um, so we're going to do it in uh, protist microcosms. So, um, so the design is going to be the same one you just saw. It's a two by two by two factorial design crossing presence, absence of dispersal, Moran effect, and predators, and then looking at the effects on prey synchrony is our response variable. So the microcosms, you can think of them as tiny artificial ponds. Okay, that's what they are. They're 80 mil culture vessels containing nutrient medium and um, bacteria. It's a semi-continuous batch culture system. So there's nutrient medium, there's bacteria growing on that, and then the prey species, so there's, a, so there's like uh, 
here's a meta population in this hand, and here's another meta population in this hand. Okay. <laughs> um, so the, uh, the prey species is a ciliate protus uh, called Tetrahymena piriformis. There's a picture of it I forgot to put on a scale bar. It's about 40 microns long or something like that, 30 or 40 microns long maybe. And um, it, its life history is very simple. It just kind of swims around, filter feeding on bacteria. It reproduces the cell just like it divides into asexually and like that's it. Okay. Um, then the uh, predator is another ciliate, Euplodes patella, which is about 140 microns long. It eats tetrahymena. It does eat some bacteria, but it can't survive on bacteria alone. Um, so the experimental units right here right, are paired bottles or patches. right? Um, we do dispersal. We disperse the organisms ourselves. So we do dispersal by exchanging 10% of the individuals, so 10% of the medium and the organisms in it, uh, to another jar in the pair three times per week. So we impose density-independent dispersal. And um, all bottles are subject to daily temperature fluctuations, which we implement by swapping bottles between incubators at different temperatures on a predetermined schedule. And so those temperature fluctuations are either independent for the two bottles or they're perfectly synchronous. And um, that's the only difference is in the synchrony. All bottles experience the same mean temperature, the same variance, same autocorrelation, all that other stuff. The only difference is the synchrony. And uh, we sample the protist by counting um, small samples taken on weekdays, too small to have a detectable effect on the dynamics. And um, we don't work weekends, so but that's OK. Um, and uh, there are six replicate uh, pairs per uh, treatment combination here. So um, every college doc, you have to have a picture of your field site. So here's my field site. Um, this is uh, Joyce McNeil, who was an undergraduate in the lab at the time. And she's conducting a dispersal event using her patented two-handed pipette technique, uh, which is the easiest way to do this. You just uh, s use each pipette to stir up the medium in the jar to homogenize it, suck out 10%, cross your arms, squirt it out into the other jar. That's a dispersal event. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, just to give you, just to show, oh yes, we do have you know, population dynamics. And by the way, and uh, Eric mentioned these things have short generation times. Um, Tetrahymenus generation time is on the, like they're going through a cell cycle under the best growth conditions of about every four to six hours. Euplodes somewhere between 24 to 48 hours, so short. The experiment lasted 63 days, so we're talking you know, dozens to hundreds of generations here. Um, so this is um, tetrahymenous dynamics on a log scale over time in just one replicate in the absence of predators and temperatures on the uh, right-hand axis here in red. Uh, tetrahymen actually, you, we start them at low density. They actually initially overshoot carrying capacity, sort of decline, and then they subsequently just sort of bounce randomly around sort of stable mean density. Uh, dynamics with the predator are much different. So now the predator density is on the, y, uh, on the uh, right hand y axis along with temperature. I just wanted to show you that yes, we do get predator prey cycles. So the prey get driven down, the pre actually to undetectably low densities, the predators increase. The predators then starve, which allows the prey to recover, right? And the cycle repeats itself. The period is somewhere between 20 to 30 ish days. So, like here, we've gone through like almost three complete cycles in the space of the experiment. Um, so let me show you what we found, so the results in terms of synchrony. So just to remind you again, here are the model predictions about prey synchrony in these uh, different treatments. Here are the data, means and standard errors. The y-axis scales are the same in all four panels. If I erase the error bars, could you tell which set of panels was the data and which was the, the model? Um, so the statistically significant treatment effects are the same ones that the model identifies. So um, yes, dispersal is synchronizing. The black circles are higher than the gray triangles. The um, Moran effect is synchronizing. So the points in the right panel are significantly higher than the points in the left panel. And uh, yes, there's a predation by dispersal interaction. Dispersal is very synchronizing. In the presence of predators, it hardly makes any difference at all in their absence. Uh, and just to show you how synchronous some of these things were, so this is one of the, the prettiest ones. So this is the dynamics of the prey in um, one pair of patches uh, with the predator, with dispersal, and with a Moran effect. Given that there's sampling error in these data, you can't get much more synchronous than that. So there's phase locking. Right. Um, so uh, uh, that's, sorry, that's just kind of an aside. Um, so Briefly, um, the, Moran, the Moran effect is synchronizing as well, although it just, it's kind of interesting. The Moran effect doesn't actually work by causing populations to track the temperature necessarily. So if you, basically if you inspect this, like tetrahymen is bouncing up and down, right? 
but it's not bouncing up and down like, oh, when it's warm, it increases, and when it's cold, it decreases, or vice versa, right? It's not tracking the temperature fluctuations. That's not actually how the Moran effect necessarily works. It can synchronize populations without, without causing them to sort of track the environmental fluctuations. So um, just to summarize what I've said so far, um, dispersal and the Moran effect are both synchronizing. But um, population dynamics, in particular, whether you have nonlinear cycles or not, like in this Rosenzweig MacArthur model, mediates the synchronizing effect of dispersal. And so, you know, because species interactions go a long way towards determining what kinds of population dynamics species exhibit, spatial synchrony, I think, is ultimately, it's ultimately a community ecology problem. It's not a population ecology problem because you do need to know something about the population dynamics. Um, and I do think this actually has, you know, not that I would say that the microcosms are like a replica of any particular natural system. They're certainly not. They're not intended to be. But I do think this in, informs us about how to sort of interpret natural data. Because as I said, many of the most striking examples of synchrony over very big areas are oscillatory dynamics like enemy victim cycles or like host pathogen kinds of things like pathogen outbreaks. And... Um, those things, again, are really easy. Just a little bit of dispersal goes a long way in synchronizing oscillatory dynamics. Whereas conversely, it turns out that it's very hard to synchronize nonlinear cycles with environmental stochasticity. And so I think there is at least a plausibility argument here that phase locking is what's going on in cases like the lynx hair cycles. Um, so um, that's me. Um, so. Uh, Next, I'm going to talk about scaling things up. Because, of course, most species in nature do not live in just two places, right? They live in uh, many different locations, sort of spread across large areas, right? And so we want to understand how synchrony works in that more sort of realistic scenario. And in particular, we want to understand another very common observation in nature, which is that spatial synchrony tends to decay with increasing distance between populations. These are just uh, results compiled by, compiled by Ronte et al. for a number of different species. Each point in each of these panels shows the synchrony of one pair of populations. There are different panels for different kinds of species, like I mean, type small like squirrels, mountain hares, various other things. And you can see, so synchrony is decaying on average with distance, right? And so we'd like to um, understand what, why that is. Um, you know, what causes that decay? So that's because that's a common pattern in nature. And it's even been suggested that um, we can actually use the pattern of decay of synchrony over space to infer the underlying mechanism, so infer process from pattern. And the intuition here is basically that if the Moran effect is what's mainly driving synchrony, then the spatial scale of synchrony should match the spatial scale at which like, weather fluctuations are synchronized. Conversely, it, the, there's an intuition that if dispersal is what's driving synchrony, well, um, then the spatial scale of synchrony should kind of line up with the spatial scale at which dispersal occurs, at which individual organisms move around. So that's the intuition. But um, we'd like to check that, you know, check that out and see if it actually works. So um, the questions here we're going to ask two questions. Why does synchrony decay with distance? And um, of course, those are the two possibilities. There's decay of environmental synchrony with distance, because nearby sites, of course, tend to have more highly correlated weather fluctuations than distant sites, right? And uh, limited dispersal distance. Organisms tend to, you know, there's higher dispersal rates between nearby populations than between distant populations. And those aren't mutually exclusive, right? So it helps to have an experiment to tease them apart. And um, second, uh, one thing that could screw up your intuition that, oh, we can you know, infer process or pattern here, one thing that can screw that up is phase locking. Okay? Because it turns out in theory that if, if even a little bit of dispersal can generate phase locking, then actually short distance dispersal can kind of scale up and you can get phase locking over much longer distances than dispersal occurs. And so we want to see if that can actually happen in an experimental system. Right? So um, the experimental units here are now linear arrays of six patches rather than just two. Um, all the patches in this experiment have predators and prey, or the same, same predators and prey as before. Uh, now it's a two by two factorial design. We're going to cross the presence or absence of a Moran effect with the presence or absence of dispersal. 
So dispersal was done in a nearest neighbor stepping stone fashion. So it was only adjacent pairs of jars that exchanged dispersers every time there was a dispersal event. And by the way, I just want to say, like, in case this system seems so simple, like any fool could do this. Like some technical ingenuity does go into this. Like, for instance, if you want to do nearest neighbor dispersal, it's actually a two-person, three pipette job. Because you can't like you can't just do an exchange between like the first two and then go do an exchange between the next two because some of the liquid here came from the first one and so you actually end up imposing like a sort of a, a dispersal kernel with a long tail which you didn't which would be interesting too because that's realistic but that's not what we wanted so like there is some cleverness that like goes into this um, and. Uh, then the Moran effect, um, we imposed a Moran effect with spatially decaying synchrony. So the way this works is um, every in, in treatments with a Moran effect, every adjacent pair of jars experienced equally highly correlated temperature fluctuations, but the correlation of those decayed over space, so the jars at opposite ends of the array, one and six, experienced independent temperature fluctuations. So that's realistic. Um, in cases where there's no Moran effect, all pairs of jars just experience independent temperature fluctuations. Um, Dave is, uh, Dave Vassar, my collaborator, is, um, has a much larger and more powerful brain than a normal person. And so um, Dave is actually the guy who figured out the algorithm to automatically generate temperature time series that all have the same mean, variance, autocorrelation, et cetera, but also have the right spatially decaying pattern of synchrony so we can generate those temperature time series. Um, so, uh, and again, we sample, you know, on weekdays. The experiment actually, only because we actually, the first time we tried it, we got too many extinctions and we had to twink the culture conditions and restart it. So, the ex so, and by that point, it was halfway done with the summer. So the experiment only lasted 50 days, which is not as long as we wanted. But it, we kind of got lucky a little bit. As you'll see, we did, it did last long enough to get clean results. So um, just to show you, again, these are illustrative prey dynamics. Each of these panels shows dynamics in one, um, array. I've just shown you two of the four replicates for each of the four treatments, so like plus Moran effect, plus dispersal, plus Moran effect, no dispersal, etc. Each panel has six lines, one for um, each of the six um, bottles. I just put this up basically to show you that, yes, Prey you know, cycled, although we really only had sort of one and a half cycles over the course of this 50-day experiment. You can't really tell anything about spatial synchrony here just by kind of eyeballing these data, so stop trying. Uh, and I will show you statistical summaries of the, uh, the synchrony here. By the way, I haven't shown you, but I should have mentioned earlier that I haven't shown you results on synchrony of predators because the predators in most of these experiments are at sufficiently low density on average that they're often below the detection limit. And so the predator dynamics are actually kind of dominated by sampling error. Um, sometimes we have good enough data to say something about predator synchrony. Sometimes the way it works out, we don't. It's just the data are just too noisy. So that's the other reason why I'm just focusing on the prey sort of dynamics here. Um, so let me, uh, let me walk you through this. So what we're going to look at here again is mean prey synchrony uh, as measured throughout the talk with uh, standard error bars as a function of the spatial lag between jars. So um, jars at lag one, that means they're one step apart. They're adjacent jars in the array. So this is the average synchrony of adjacent jars in the array. Jars five steps apart are the the, that's the only the two jars at opposite ends of the array. So we're averaging across like all pairs that are a given number of steps apart within each array. Um, the stats on this, it requires multivariate stats, but they're actually fairly straightforward. I could talk about the details of the stats if anyone cared afterwards. Um, and so then uh, we're going to indicate the different treatments with um, different uh, you know, filled and open symbols and different shapes, squares versus circles here. So um, let me walk you through this. Oh, that's boring, boring. Um, Okay, uh, first thing to see is that dispersal is in fact synchronizing. So um, what I'm trying to, uh, I put this red line in here just to guide your eye. The, um, the treatments with dispersal are the circles and they're all above the line. The treatments with the squares have no dispersal and they're all below the line. So dispersal is synchronizing. Um, the more interesting thing here is that dispersal is synchronizing to the same degree at all spatial lags. That's the signature of array-wide phase locking. So what's going on here is like, you know, the, the gap in synchrony between like this point and the corresponding point without dispersal, so the filled circle and the, the filled square or the open circle and the open square, is the same on average at lag one. Those are the jars that are exchanging dispersers. It's the same at opposite ends of the array, even though those jars are five steps apart, okay? What's going on here is that 
to a first approximation, this isn't literally true, but to a first, this gives you the intuition. To a first approximation, spatial synchrony is kind of an all or nothing phenomenon. You either have phase, phase locking is. You either have phase locking or you don't, right? So if, if like the first two jars in the array are phase locked with one another because they're, you know, exchanging dispersers, and the next two jars in the array are phase locked with one another because they're exchanging dispersers, the first and third have to be two. So it works that way across the entire array. That's what's going on. Short distance dispersal generates long distance phase locking. Um, the Moran effect increases synchrony as well. So the, um, the, the filled symbols are higher than the corresponding open symbols. But that's only true at short distances. It's only true at the first two lags. Where the Moran effect is strongest, where the environmental fluctuations are most synchronous, right? Jars that are more than there are three or more steps apart, you're starting to get to like, you know, only mildly correlated, or in the case of jars five steps apart, uncorrelated temperature fluctuations. And so we only pick up the Moran effect where you'd expect it to be strongest at short spatial distances. Because the Moran effect is, is strongest at short spatial lags. Synchrony decays with distance only in those treatments where there is a Moran effect present. It does not actually decay significantly with distance in the absence of the Moran effect. So we do get spatial decay of synchrony, and again, these red lines are just to guide your eye here. Only the filled symbols exhibit spatial decay of, of synchrony over longer and longer separation distances. The white symbols may sort of look like they do, they actually don't want you to control for other you know, factors here in your GLM. And, there, oh, there's, and there's no Moran effect by dispersal interaction, which there's some theory that predicted that there might be, and at least in this experiment, there's not. Although I think it's possible there actually could be if you watch you know, for a much longer period of time. So uh, take home messages here. Um, it, dispersal does generate long distance phase locking. Um, and so, uh, and distance decay of synchrony, we do get that, but it's due to the Moran effect. Basically what's happening is like you get phase locking of the predator prey cycle, but then the environmental fluctuations also superimpose on that cycle stochastic sort of little blips, little ups and downs in prey abundance, and the Moran effect synchronizes those. And so when you have a Moran effect, you get additional synchrony above and beyond the phase locking, but that additional synchrony decays with distance, and that's why you, you know, so that's why it's overall synchrony decays with uh, distance here. Um, I think the same, again, I suspect the same is likely true in many natural systems, and the, and the reason is because short distance dispersal, if you have cyclic dynamics, dispersal is going to tend to phase lock them. If you don't have cycles, there's nothing to phase lock, and dispersal shouldn't have much effect on synchrony at all. Either way, it's kind of hard to get dispersal to generate spatial decay of synchrony, actually. I think it, in biologically realistic models. I think models that suggest otherwise, and there are models that suggest otherwise, actually are kind of sort of artificial, not very biologically realistic models. Um, so I suspect that a lot of distance decay of synchrony nature is due to distance decay of the Moran effect. Um, that was a lot to uh, sort of remember. I threw a lot of words at you. So, um, so to summarize this first two thirds of the talk, um, Spatial synchrony of predator prey cycles works like this. And I'm actually going to need to like, just uh, unmute the computer here so that you can hear the sound as well as see the video. <laughs> So these are two metronomes started ticking out of phase. They're sitting on a platform that is balanced, the same platform which is balanced on two Coke cans, empty soda, bo empty soda cans. So they're coupled together, right, because they feel the same vibrations. And if you notice, they started out out of phase and it's changing. And now they are, I think it's about there, yeah. They're in sync and they're gonna stay that way. This is Huygens' clocks, a modern version a little bit. The coupling works a little differently here than if you hang things on a wall, so that's why the attracting state is in phase rather than perfectly out of phase. And uh, it turns out mathematically in this case, the, the coupling in this system, mathematically it's equivalent to density independent dispersal. Okay, the math works out the same, okay? <laughs> this, is, this is, yeah, this is what's happening in that first experiment, is this. And if you search around online, you can find versions of the second experiment because you can put like you know six metronomes on the same platform with several soda cans underneath them, and it'll do the same thing. They'll all line up. 
Um, so uh, in the time remaining, uh, I want to switch from talking about switch gears from talking about the causes of synchrony to its consequences. And so this is new work. So I, I basically the stuff I told you about is like years old here. So this is new stuff I haven't uh, written up yet. And so um, I'm going to talk to you about a kind of surprising consequence of synchrony or a surprising consequence until you sort of think about it, then I think it's very intuitive, which I'm calling a spatial hydra effect. So in Greek mythology, the uh, hydra is a mythical monster that grows two new heads every time one is cut off. Okay, right? So, um, you know, having your head cut off actually makes you stronger. In ecology, Peter Abrams coined the term hydra effect for situations in which increasing the mortality rate of a population actually increases its abundance. Okay, so something that seems like it should be bad for you actually turns out to be good for you, as it were. I'm going to tell you about a spatial hydra effect. I'm going to tell you about situations in a metapopulation Increasing the rate at which local subpopulations go extinct is actually good for the persistence of the metapopulation as a whole. Okay? And I'm not going to build some, like, some weird assumptions. I'm not going to tell you about some mythical world to make that happen. I'm going to show you how a spatial hydra effect actually falls out of the most bog standard simple textbook metapopulation models. Okay? It's been lurking in plain sight. Okay, it's an implication, it's an unrecognized implication of our standard sort of baseline picture of how metapopulations work. So let's first remind ourselves of that simple picture. So here's the usual story. The usual story is that intermediate dispersal rates maximize metapopulation persistence. And so this is what this cartoon is. Right? So on the, on the y-axis, we have metapopulation persistence time as a function of dispersal rate among the you know, subpopulations. Okay? So there's sort of three regimes, three dynamical regimes here. right? At zero or low rates of dispersal, the patches are effectively independent of one another. right? Colonization events are very, very rare relative to extinction events. And so the metapopulation as a whole basically just lasts as long as the longest lived subpopulation happens to last because recolonizations hardly ever happen. And there's, and of course, and those subpopulations operate independently and are asynchronous, right? Because what would synchronize them, right? Because there's hardly any dispersal. At intermediate dispersal rates, now you get right, colonization extinction dynamics, that classic sort of Levin's blinking light metapopulation picture, right? Because now colonization events happen at least as commonly as extinction events. And so if a subpopulation goes extinct, it tends to be recolonized very quickly. Finally, you have too much of a good thing. At high dispersal rates, you synchronize the fluctuations in different subpopulations. And so now the metapopulation as a whole effectively is one big honking patch. Right, because it's synchronized globally. And so then the question, how long does it persist? That depends on whether one big patch is highly persistent or whether one big patch is extinction prone. And that depends on the details of the, uh, the local population dynamics. In particular, if they're sort of like high amplitude oscillation so that the you know, abundances tend to bottom out at a very low level, even in, a, even in one big patch, then that's when you're going to be sort of extinction prone. Okay, so that's the standard picture. And this is just to show you that I didn't just you know, make that up. Um, this is a, a Yari et al. 2012, very nice uh, ecology paper, kind of exhaustively simulated the behavior of many, many different simple stochastic metapopulation models, and they all behave in this way. This is just the illustration of the behavior of one of those models, so persistence time is a function of dispersal rate, and you get this sort of humped you know, curve of the metapopulation persistence time is a function of dispersal rate. Okay. And, and all of that doesn't, and none of that depends on sort of the details of what you assume about the sort of the nature of the local population dynamics or whatever. Right? It's just, just sort of generic. So, and we do have some empirical evidence that things can work this way. Um, for instance, of course, Fa Huffaker's famous study of uh, predator and prey metapopulation of mites on oranges, right? Um, when you just have this array of of oranges um, that the mites can live on. It's effectively like one big patch because the mites get around very easily. There's very high dispersal rate. And so it doesn't persist very long. You basically have one predator-prey oscillation. These are the dynamics over time, right? The prey go up, then the predators go up, have this huge peak, and then they starve, and then they're like gone, and it doesn't persist that long. If you put in barriers to dispersal, now you've lowered the dispersal rate. Now you're in the colonization extinction dynamics regime. And so like 
this is his sort of, like you imagine taking a series of pictures from the air of his array as to where like the prey currently are. You can see sometimes they're abundant in some patches, some the rest of the black is, sometimes they're rare. And the whole thing, if you look at the dynamics over time, the oscillations persist for much, much longer. Um, Holyoke and Longler, 1996, is a protist microcosm experiment. It's basically the properly controlled, replicated version of Huffaker. Um, so this is a protist predator prey pair, a different predator and prey than I use. In um, single isolated patches, um, they don't persist uh, very long, and there's not much variation around that. So there's your low dispersal case for a short persistence time for the metapopulation as a whole. If you have a single big patch, so which is effectively equivalent to a metapopulation with a really high dispersal rate, so you just have a very big, oops, oh, very big uh, culture vessel. And uh, what did I do here? Ah, there we go. Um, the persistence time is somewhat longer. But when you really get a long persistence time is when you have arrays of jars connected by little tubes through which the protists can disperse at low rates, um, but not zero rates. And so now you're in the colonization extinction dynamics regime, and, and it turns out that prey and predator cycles are asynchronous across these patches. Um, so the standard picture seems to you know, work, at least in some cases, which raises a puzzle, because you know, how are asynchronous colonization extinction dynamics even possible, right? Especially in cases where the local subpopulations are cyclic. So that's what I just showed you in the first part of the talk, right? Even a little bit of dispersal goes a long way towards synchronizing oscillations. So how come you don't go, as you sort of jack up dispersal rate, how come you don't go kind of straight from like a regime where, okay, there's no dispersal and so no synchrony, like almost straight to like, oh, phase locking. Everything's synchronized. Where does this intermediate regime of colonization, asynchronous colonization extinction dynamics even come from? Well, it's a spatial hydro effect. It comes from the extinctions, right? Local extinctions are desynchronizing, right? That's the intuition here, right? So if a, if a local subpopulation goes extinct and then gets recolonized, right? After it gets recolonized, it's no longer going to be in sync with those other populations with which it previously was extinct, right? It went extinct. And nor is it going to have the same abundance as it would have had had it not gone extinct, right? So local spatially independent extinctions tend to destroy synchrony, okay? Which means that, and of course, anything that reduces synchrony promotes recolonization, right? And thus persistence, right? Because the colonists have to come from somewhere, right? If a local subpopulation goes extinct, there needs to be other subpopulations that currently have high abundance you know, in order for you to have good odds of recolonization happening. So you need asynchrony, right? So the irony here is it's like giving it with one hand, taking it with the other, right? The very same local extinctions that put the entire metapopulation at risk of extinction are what create the asynchrony that the metapopulation needs to mitigate that extinction risk. Okay, what local extinctions taketh away, local extinctions giveth back by a different route. Um, so, and it's suggestive that empirical examples of colonization extinction dynamics, like I just showed you, do involve extinction prone sort of cyclic subpopulations, right? Um, so, it's suggestive that this is actually the reason why you see the results that you see. But um, I'm going to now prove it to you uh, theoretically. So, um, okay. So I'm going to so let me illustrate this with a simple sort of toy model, and I could have picked a lot of different toy models that would actually do the same thing. So I'm going to show you. Uh, I'm going to pull one of the models from Yari et al. This is a um, stochastic spatial version of the Nicholson Bailey host parasitoid model. Okay, and uh, but if I had any model I picked that had like basically oscillatory local dynamics would do the same thing. Uh, I'm going to just arbitrarily pick a situation where there's just uh, four patches, no, and none of my decisions here really matter. Um, and I'm going to assume that there's global dispersal of both species. I could have picked local dispersal, it would have come out about the same. Um, and all this is the, so I'm going to simulate a four patch system, a stochastic metapopulation with global dispersal. That's all the same as Yari et al. Here's the wrinkle. At the end of each time step, after all those other events, because this is a discrete time model, um, I'm going to introduce random subpopulation destruction. Okay? So there's going to be some constant probability per patch, per time step, that anything in that patch, all the hosts, all the parasitoids, just get instantly wiped out. Okay? Now that doesn't change the patch. The patch itself is still available for recolonization should that occur. Okay? So this is not a habitat loss model or anything like that. Okay? Um, and uh, so let me show you that 
dynamics here. Okay, so first here's a case with um, low dispersal and no subpopulation destruction. I'm just showing you the host dynamics over time and there's one line for each of the four patches. I'm not showing you the parasitoid just because it would clutter things up. You can see they start out all at the same abundance. They start out in sync. Demographic stochasticity quickly kicks those oscillations you know, out of sync. And there's, uh, there's very low dispersal, so recolonization events basically hardly ever happen. And so the whole the metapopulation just lasts as long as the longest lived subpopulation happens to last. Here, the red and black ones happen to go extinct at time step, I don't know, 32 or something. Um, you know, here are the dynamics under intermediate dispersal, again, with no subpopulation destruction. And so now we jack up the dispersal rate. And so now we're in the colonization extinction dynamics regime. Now colonization events are common relative to extinction events. And so what you can see is, um, right, the different, there's asynchronous fluctuations across the different patches, but if they go extinct, you know, every time they drop to zero, they get recolonized. And so the whole thing persists for much, much longer than it did in the previous slide. And if we jack up dispersal further, Whoops, now we've got one big patch. We've synchronized everything. We phase locked the whole thing. And so everybody just, whap, goes extinct together in a very short period of time. That's with no subpopulation destruction. Here's the same case as the previous slide. We still got high dispersal, but now we have a, at some rate, random subpopulation destruction. And now look what's happened, right? Now they're much less synchronous than they were before, right? So local extinctions are interfering with the synchrony. And, um, but since we have at a high dispersal rate, like if, like say here's the green pop, you know, the green population for instance, here's a case where it got uh, wiped out by an accident, but then was immediately recolonized. But it's no longer in sync with those other populations, right? Here's, um, let's see, I think there's another case where it happened to the green population. Um, yeah, there's several cases where that happens. Here's one where it happened to the red population. And so the whole thing lasts for much longer than it did in the uh, previous slide because you're interfering with this, the local extinctions are interfering with the synchrony. It's just a, so okay, that was one illustrative example. Let me show you, summarize the results of many more simulations than that. So I'm gonna show you, um, this is uh, mean metapopulation persistence time in this model as a function of uh, dispersal rate for, I'm gonna show you results for different rates of subpopulation destruction. Here's the case for no subpopulation destruction. So it's just this classic you know, humped curve with a peak in persistence at intermediate dispersal rates. We add in subpopulation destruction and we do two things. You shift, you think of shifting the black curve down, right? Because you're, you're causing local subpopulations to go extinct, that's bad. So you're shifting the black curve down, but because you're interfering with synchrony, you also shift that black curve to the right because you now need a higher dispersal rate to get into the colonization extinction dynamics regime and you need a higher dispersal rate to synchronize everything and overcome those local extinctions and synchronize them. So the net effect of that is above some critical value of the dispersal rate, the red curve is above the black curve. There's your spatial hydro effect. The net effect of local extinctions is to increase the average persistence time of the metapopulation. And if you uh, keep jacking up the rate of subpopulation destruction, you keep shifting that curve down and to the right, and so you shift upwards the critical dispersal rate at which, you know, above which you see your uh, spatial hydra effect. So um, in summary, uh, hydras are real. Uh, the, um, the effect can vary in strength and be swamped by other effects. I mean, I've only shown you a toy model here. So, so basically, like, the, the, that curve still shifts down and the right in any model, but the, uh, the downward shift really outweighs the rightward shift in cases where one big patch is fairly persistent, which, uh, which makes sense, right? If, if synchronizing everything is not that bad for, you know, metapopulation persistence, then preventing synchrony doesn't really help that much. Right, so, so the effect is much weaker or non-existent in cases where one big synchronous metapopulation is, uh, is actually pretty persistent. Um, there are no empirical data that I know of directly testing this. We're probably, I'm probably gonna have a go with a little pilot experiment this fall trying to see if we can test this. The closest thing is um, Matter and Roland have a study in uh, Proc Race B back in 2010 where they experimentally um, wiped out one subpopulation in a butterfly metapopulation. But it was different in a couple of ways. One is that they wiped it out and kept it out, so it was a permanent loss of this 
population and spatial heterogeneity is key in their system. They basically wiped out a big population that was a key source of immigrants, like a source population to others. So actually wiping that subpopulation out increased synchrony because basically it was a permanent sort of synchronized perturbation to the entire system, which is very different than what I'm modeling here. Um, the, um, I think the other thing to take home about this, which I sort of only came to appreciate through thinking about Yari et al's paper a lot, is that metapopulation dynamics are really simple. The biological details only matter via their effect on the colonization extinction rate. Rates of, when you're talking about a metapopulation, all that matters is rates of colonization extinction. Okay? Just like if you're talking about population growth, ultimately the only thing that matters is births and deaths. Right? Everything else only matters via its effect on those rates. You know, the sort of funny thing here is that local extinctions, obviously, by definition, affect the extinction rate, but they indirectly affect the colonization rate and increase it via their desynchronizing effect. Okay. So um, that, that's as much as I uh, had to say, so I'll just uh, stop there. Thanks for uh, listening. There are various ways you could tweak this to make it more realistic. I mean, I did deliberately chose an unrealistic but extreme scenario, right? Like, I chose kind of the, the worst case scenario for a spatial hydro effect. Like, the perturbations here are actually like wiping subpopulations out. So, in terms of the direct effect of that on persistence, it's, well, that's kind of the worst case scenario. Although, they indirectly, they're also. In some ways, maybe it's a good case scenario because indirectly, that's very desynchronizing, right? Um, yeah, you can imagine, absolutely, you can imagine a lot of wrinkles. Realistically, if, and I mean, already these models have in them, like, I mean, demographic stochasticity, right, is, is a much bigger deal at low population sizes than at high population sizes where good luck and bad luck just, you know, average out, right? And um, so these models already have in them, you know, the sort of effect you're talking about of bigger extinction risk at low population sizes. Um, so you could try, for instance, trying to get at that by, like, for instance, dialing up or down the sort of demographic variance, right, the strength of demographic stochasticity, um, or um, so that's one way to get at it. Um, you could imagine um, looking at, like, okay, we're not going to impose local extinctions. We're going to impose, like, some kind of environmental fluctuation somehow. Maybe that's spatially synchronous or not, because, of course, you could, you know, the flip side of this is, like, Anything that synchronizes the meta population is kind of bad, right? So you can imagine like environmental fluctuations might also like reduce persistence time at the subpopulation level and tend to synchronize things. So the two of those together could be like, ooh, geez, like double whammy, right? Um, so yeah, there's a lot of directions you could kind of yeah take this. So thinking about applying this a little bit. Do you think that this hydra effect could explain um, like the persistence of certain plant or wildlife species in like, really fragmented, disturbed urban areas? So, yes, yeah, so this is a good question. When I uh, when I first came up with this, basically I thought of this as just like, oh, this is this interesting aspect of the behavior of this toy model. I'm not sure I could like. Can I point to an example in nature where, like, oh, we've jacked up, or maybe we should jack up the local extinction rate in order to help them out, right? To help them persist. Or, like, uh, you know, um, so, but then it was, I had a conversation I, uh, uh, with, a, with a disease ecologist, disease, my dynamic epidemiological modeler at uh, Chicago, who was saying that, you know, this could be going on for certain diseases, in particular, like, uh, year-round persistence of influenza in tropical areas, I am, I am told, because I don't really know, is um, like it does really seem to persist as like local outbreaks that really do go extinct locally at like the city level and then have to get, you know, recolonized from, from elsewhere. And of course, there's a lot of studies of like spatial synchrony of diseases and how movement of, you know, hosts and things, right, synchronizes, you know, disease outbreaks or creates recolonization events. And so... And people have good models of that. So one thing you could do to try to get out whether this happening in nature is take a system where we have, you know, 
we think we have a good handle on what's going on with the dynamics and use that model to kind of do the thought experiments, right? And see if like, oh, can you use a spatial hydra effect to kind of manipulate the system? Whether you'd actually have the confidence to do it because you're talking about like, you know, Really, if we want to get rid of this disease globally, what should we should do is encourage everybody who has it to move around a lot to create one big synchronized global outbreak, and then wham, it'll be extinct. Because like, <laughs> the problem is that it's going extinct locally, and it's interfering with the synchrony. Uh, I don't know that I would necessarily recommend that as, <laughs> as a strategy here. Uh, <laughs> but... Uh, but, yeah, it's, I think of it as more of... Like, it gives you a better under. I don't know if you necessarily use it as itself as a management tool, but I think it gives you a better understanding of kind of what's going on when you're dealing with a you know meta population. And people do often worry about like, will these corridors synchronize them or not or whatever. Like, this helps you better understand when you might expect that to happen or not. Uh, similar to that question, going back to the famous links here. And you've got such habitat heterogeneity and difficulties of dispersal in you know, a thousand kilometers of wheat fields or something that these species don't like. Are the dispersal rates realistic between those so, populations to actually derive? So, um, so with, I mean, with links in here specifically, I mean, I'm not. I'm certainly not an expert. I mean, lynx do uh, you know, hares don't maybe move around over huge areas. Lynx actually have like really big honk and home ranges, right? Like they're pretty mobile animals. So I, all of Canada is not like well one well mixed sort of lynx population like genetically, but it's there's not that much sort of like isolation by distance or whatever in lynx because they are quite mobile. Um, the question you raise is is certainly a uh, a good one. There certainly are cases where people are now trying to look for. Um, basically more complicated phenomenon that I've talked about in this talk, just kind of like, oh, do we have sort of global synchrony or not? Because if you do have a spatial environmental heterogeneity um, and also possibly different dispersal rates between different subpopulations, you absolutely, you're right, would expect that to affect the spatial pattern of synchrony. Um, and uh, so there are people starting to look for that, because basically to look for that, right, you need sort of very spatially and temporally well-resolved data at many sites where you also know about the environmental heterogeneity. And just environmental, and you know, one sort of simple expectation is that environmental heterogeneity in general should probably sort of interfere with synchrony to the extent that you have sort of like different dynamics in different places, you basically shouldn't be able, to, it should be much harder to synchronize that, right? Because you've got to force them to be the same dynamics too. Um, but having said that, there certainly are cases like um, some forest insect outbreaks are kind of synchronized across different forest types. So there certainly are cases where the, the synchronizing forces do seem to be strong enough to overcome whatever sort of spatial heterogeneity there, there is. It's certainly an experiment you could do in, in microcosms. It's easy enough to like couple together microcosms that have you know, different environments you've imposed, like different culture conditions, and then have dispersal among them. And so you can manipulate that and see if uh, spatial heterogeneity interferes with synchrony or not. Take one more question. And then Um, do you do you attribute demographic stochasticity as the reason why you can have local extinction of a subpopulation that is supposedly synchronous with all the other subpopulations? It's, uh, well, it's, I mean, it's certainly one reason why it could happen. I mean, um, in the protist microcosm specifically, I mean, we do. Um, we do sometimes get, or at least we think we get, local extinctions and then recolonizations. In practice, the way we're sampling, it's often difficult to distinguish a true local extinction from like, oh, they just dropped to undetectably low density and then later, you know, rose back up above the detection limit. Uh, we'd have to change our sampling procedure to get at it. Um, whether the, yeah, whether the causes are, you know, in any particular case are sort of demographic stochasticity you know, versus other sorts of effects, I think, can be just in general kind of a tricky thing to, maybe a little bit of a tricky thing to get at. This system, the protus microcosm system, unfortunately, is maybe not the best for kind of quantifying demographic stochasticity just because, um, it, I mean, it's a great system for some things, but it's a terrible system for, like, marking and tracking the fates of individuals. 
So <laughs> you can't like tag a bunch of protists or whatever. So all we see is sort of the net you know, effects. And of course, as in any system, right, just like in any system where when the organisms get rare, it's tough to sort of you know, sample them and stuff. In our system, that's true too. So I wouldn't sort of like necessarily say that, oh, demographic stochasticity is the cause of local extinctions, but it could be, it certainly could be a contributor because, okay, these protists are capable of achieving very high population size of high abundance, but when they bottom out in those predator-prey cycles, their absolute abundances in these jars are, they're small. Right. So, yeah. So, like, as it relates to the hydro effect, though, I'm yeah. just trying okay. to imagine how synchronous populations could have some subset that goes that goes extinct to, in order to... Well, they're all synchronous, right? They're all just, they're all synchronously, sorry, and uh, apologies for, for answering a question you weren't actually asking before. I'll now answer the question you were actually asking. Um, so when, um, right, think of all the subpopulations dropped to some fairly low level, and there it's similar abundances or maybe exactly the same abundance or whatever. And, um, but demographic stochasticity, right, so in a deterministic world, they would all drop to exactly the same low density and then at some point later, you know, recover from that. But because of demographic stochasticity, you've got variance in their fates, right? So just by dumb luck or the net effects of dumb luck operating on individuals, like, oh, geez, in that population over there, the last individual, like, got unlucky and died a bit earlier than you would have expected. Oh, and this one over here, the last individual got a bit lucky and reproduced first. And so this one went extinct and that one didn't. Yeah. All right, thanks very much.